All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the second day of the uh, 14th annual uh, Flowtex 2021 virtual meeting. Uh, I'm David Havlin on behalf of the uh, uh, Flowtex committee. And again, today, we're going to run from 9 to 1.30 Central Standard Time. Today's main focus is data analysis, followed by our keynote speaker, Dr. Florian Marr, at the end of the day. Each panel will end with a roundtable discussion with our speaker so they can answer questions that you can submit through YouTube, Twitter, or the email at flotex at flotex.org. I would also like to remind you off the heels of yesterday, don't hesitate to, re to, uh, to refresh your YouTube. Every now and then you will freeze and hit refresh to keep it going. Uh, also keep the link handy. Uh, there has been a question of um, continuing education credits. I will put my email address in the YouTube uh, chat. Um, I've pretty much handled the, the uh, continuation, uh, continuing education credits for Flowtex. And just before we get started, everybody needs a good run in the morning. Always remember that between glasses and a mask, you might be entitled to condensation. OK, with that, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Rui Gardner from the Sloan Kettering uh, Institute for Cancer Research um, there, in New there in New York. Rui graduated in biochemistry in 1997 and as a trainee in mathematical biology, which, which set the ground for his doctoral work. Mathematical approach to understanding the peroxidase mechanisms and superoxide dismutase. This was done partly in the Department of Micro at University of Michigan, but also at USC and the Gulbenkian Institute in Portugal. In 2004, he, he earned his PhD in biomedical sciences, followed by his postdoctoral work at the Gulbenkian Institute, where he became the flow core manager of the facility. In 2016, he came over and heads up the flow cytometry court, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York. He's very active uh, in the flow community, having been involved with both Flowtex and other societies and put in a, put in a number of years with uh, ISAC Council. So it is with great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rui Gardner, where he'll speak on controls and multi-parameter flow cytometry. And with that, Rui, the floor is yours. Thanks, David, um, and and thank you for the uh, you know for the invitation uh, from the Flow, Flow uh, Text com um, Committee. Um, you know, for me, it's really exciting to 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 be involved with the, with this committee, um, and um, it's been really a pleasure to um, to help organizing this this um, this meeting. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about um, controls and best practices in in, in multi-parameter flow cytometry, mm -hmm. and you see, and you know, it all starts with um, you know when you're thinking of immunophenotyping, you really want to um, uh, start by thinking about um, what are your choices of uh, color combinations, right, with your antibodies that you're using, and and the way it starts before you even start building your 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 panel mm -hmm. is um, by um, by understanding the instruments that you have available, right. So you want to make sure that um, they have the correct uh, optical configuration, or at least to know what are the um, options that you have um, uh, available, so that you can start thinking about the, the, the choices of, of, um, of color combinations. And then um, you want to start thinking of um, uh, your uh, panel design, right? Things like antigen density that Pervy is going to be talking about for sure, and about spreading, and how do you put these things together? In a way that you can um, uh, start building the best panel, but but this is just um, the first step where um, you start um, displaying and laying out your your choices. But then there's a whole uh, load of things that you need to consider in terms of optimization and troubleshooting, um, and where where controls here become essential, um, so that you can um, you know go through several iterations of um, of building a panel, right? Um, and this is the things that we're going to talk about today. So the, um, for me, and I think uh, Derek Davis mentioned yesterday and very well, the, you know, the, the, the thing that you really need to think about um, when you're doing any flow, type of flow cytometry experiment, and in particular when you're doing immunophenotyping, 
is you want to make sure you maximize the signal to noise ratio, right? That's the most important thing. And actually everything here, all the controls and best practices that we're going to talk about um, are really meant to um, uh, maximize um, this signal to noise ratio, or at least not to compromise it too much, right? Um, so this is this is really the, the the most important thing that you need to think about um, when when thinking of this. So as I mentioned, the first thing is to think of your instrument uh, without going into many details. The the, the um, you know I get this question a lot. Um, uh, whether we should start by titrating our um, antibodies or should we start by um, characterizing and optimizing uh, detectors of our instrument for our experiment. And the answer is simple. You need to start with your instrument, right? You need to characterize well your instrument. Um, so of course you um, have to make sure that uh, the daily routine QC is, is, is performed to make sure that the instrument is performing well. And then for your particular experiment, you wanna make sure that the, at least the alpha fluorescence of your cells is significantly above the intrinsic noise of each of the detectors, right? And this is specific, especially um, uh, important with, with PMTs. Um, so intrinsic noise is something that it's not amplified when you increase the gains or the voltages. Um, so you, you, you want to make sure that you have them, and this is what I show here, that you have the minimum voltage that will give you maximum resolution, right? Again, it's all about resolution. So you want to make sure that your instrument is well characterized. That's what we, you know, call it typically. Um, and, you know, the question makes sense because we typically use single um, stain controls um, for, for optimizing these, these each, each detector. And so, you know, if you're, if you're going to use a single stain control, then you need to know if you have already enough antibody um, that will give you a good separation, right? So it seems like it's a catch-22. But again, um, there are um, several methods that involve, for instance, just using unstained cells and um, stained beads um, where you don't have to um, worry about titration. And, and you can use these uh, or other methods to characterize your instrument and make sure that it's performing well, right? So that's the first thing. Your instrument needs to be well characterized and to make sure that you're using for every detector the minimum voltage or gain that will give you maximum resolution. Then you can start thinking of um, titration and, and other types of control and running uh, your samples. So one of the, um, and this was mentioned yesterday, one of the most important controls uh, for troubleshooting, uh, but mostly for, for uh, interpretation of your data is using a viability die. And again, I know that this was discussed yesterday and, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions during the round table about this, but you know, the most important thing is to realize that antibodies bind to dead cells indiscriminately, right? So this leads to, to false positives. And here's a nice example taken from, from the, the flow posts that we, um, that we published on a regular basis. This is um, an effort that was um, developed and led by, by Kathy Daniels in, in our lab. And we have a lot of examples, so feel free to, to go to our website and check. Uh, we have many of these flow posts with, with tips and tricks and, and, and uh, myth busters and things like that. And here, what you see is that if you don't use a dead cell exclusion um, marker, what, you're, what, what you have is, for instance, with the CD4, you have 20% uh, compared where, with the, um, uh, the example where we did use a dead cell exclusion, um, and we only have 11%. So almost half of these um, cells were actually um, false positives due to the fact that we weren't using a viability dye. And some people will say, well, you know, I don't really need to use a viability dye because I can distinguish uh, my dead cells and live cells from scatter. And here's an example of a cell line where that is pretty obvious, but you have to remember that, you know, um, this could be so with the untreated cells. But if you're treating cells, for instance, with, with um, um, I don't know, some treatment that will change the scatter uh, properties of, the, of your cells, you may end up with a situation where you no longer can distinguish from scatter and using a viability dye would be very important. Or if you work in a cancer center like, like I do, most of the samples will actually look like this, this bottom um, example where um, the dead cells and live cells will overlap uh, tremendously. So there is no way that we can use scatter to, to do that. So um, given the amount of choices and the, the amount of um, 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 you know, detectors that we have in our instruments, I, I think there's no excuse nowadays not to use um, a viability dye, especially, and again, all these things are based on the assumption that you want the best 
quality data uh, possible, right? Of course, if you don't want the good quality data, then forget these controls, but you know, we're assuming that this is where you want to get at, right? Um, and um, also, you know, it was mentioned yesterday uh, in the in the YouTube chat that, um, you know, when, for instance, you're sorting cells, um, uh, typically um, what you're going to be sorting is the live cells, which are negative for the viability die. So if you're concerned with the impact that that viability die can have in, in, in you know, growing your cells afterwards, um, you shouldn't be too concerned about that. Now, the problem is that um, um, that can be a concern if you don't use the right amount of, of uh, viability dye. So titrating the viability dye is quite important to make sure that, for instance, if you're using DAPI, uh, if you use too much DAPI, it will go in even to live cells. And then yes, you will have some cells that are that are labeled and, and may be impacted. And, and this is also concerning when you have these fixable viability dyes where they label the positive the live cells and the negative cells. So titrating these um, um, these dyes is quite important so that not only if you're sorting, it doesn't impact, um, you know, especially if it's a viability dye, that doesn't impact your, your downstream applications. But if you're doing analysis and using a fixable dye, um, you also want to make sure that, for instance, here you see that um, as we increase the dilution, we still keep the same separation but the signal of the negative is much closer, uh, negative population, uh, the live cells is much closer to the unstained, right? Um, and remember that if it's too high, um, if this dye is actually spilling over into other channels, it may impact the quality of your data, right? So again, you wanna make sure to titrate the viability dye also. And here's another example of um, one of our flow post-its where you can see here by coincidence, the, the, um, the concentration was exactly, or the dilution was exactly the same, but you can see here with, um, if it's too concentrated, then basically the negative will shift and it can have an impact if this fluorochrome is spilling over in, in other channels, right? Whereas if you titrate it, you still get a very nice separation. You can see where are the dead cells and the live cells essentially are unlabeled and so won't impact at all in, um, in, the, um, in, in increasing spread in your other channels, right? So viability die extremely important here. Um, the other control that is um, very important is uh, to control for um, FC receptor binding. So FC receptors, um, as you probably know, are found in the surface of, of many cell types like B cells, DCs, NKs, macrophages, etc. And, and they contribute to the protective functions of the immune system. So um, we don't call this un, unspecific staining, we call it unwanted staining, right? This or unwanted binding. Because um, you, you want your um, uh, antibodies to bind specifically to an antigen um, um, and not through their FC region, right? Um, so um, there are many ways to, um, many reagents that we can use to block these FC receptors to prevent this from happening, or else you're going to have a lot of um, unspecific or again, unwanted binding, um, which will increase your background and, um, and of course, will reduce your signal to noise ratio, right? Um, and if you want to know more about the impact of um, 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 FC blocks in your in your research, um, you know, um, feel free to um, take a look at this poem that um, Kathy Daniels wrote, um, or go to our YouTube channel where you could listen to the the poem being recited um, and to understand what the impact of uh, FC block uh, could have in your data. Um, so the the other type of controls that that we typically use in, in flow cytometry is single stain controls. Now we usually think of single stain controls as um, controls to use in compensation or on mixing, but actually there are a lot of use uh, use um, uses for these type of controls. Um, uh, one of them, for instance, is uh, for titration, right, for 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 measuring antibody performance, um, or for compensation on mixing, as I mentioned or for um, assessing the quality of your panel design. And there are many more actually uses, uh, but I'll go through these, um, these three um, uh, for the sake of uh, time. So let's start with titration. So titration is, is um, one of the most important things to do when you are setting up your, um, your uh, uh, multicolor panel, um, whether it's two colors or 30 or 40, um, doing titration is, is, is extremely important. And the way to do this is actually to run a single stain control with the antibody that you want to um, 
um, um, make sure that it's um, you know clearly separating between the negative and positive, or at least as much as possible. Um, so again, it's all about maximizing resolution, and you want to take into consideration the separation, but also the spread of the background, right? So when we start um, um, adding more and more antibody, um, you'll see that it um, you know you get more and more antibody binding to the right antigen. But when you reach um, you're going to reach a certain point where um, the antigen is saturated, and if you continue adding antibody, what ends up happening is that you're going to start having unspecific staining, and so you're increasing the background. You're either increasing the background signal, um, as you can see um, here, as we increase the the concentration. You're either increasing the background signal, or you're increasing the spread of that background. So again. Again, you are impacting the resolution and decreasing the, the, the resolution and impacting the quality of your data, right? So make sure to um, titrate all of the antibodies that you're going to use um, as your first step before even starting to put everything together uh, in, in the multicolor. Because um, once you do that, it will be very difficult to understand if the impact is from um, poorly titrated antibodies or from many other things like spillover, um, etc. Um, and again, this is data from one of our flow posts. So feel free to to take a look at the um, at the at the, at the flow post that we have on this um, done by Joanna. Um, so the other uses I mentioned, and you're probably very familiar with, is um, of, of single stain controls is for compensation, right? And what is compensation? Well, <clears throat> one of the definitions is <clears throat> compensation is to correct the spillover. Right, and I and, and this is a correct statement. Although um, I'm, I, you know, I, I I'm not so um, so happy about the, the this definition, uh, just because um, the way I see compensation and on mixing is more of a way to measure the abundance of a certain fluorochrome, right, in, in your cell. And, and what we mean with compensation, so in classical flow cytometry, is that we want to remove or subtract the signal from, from fluorochromes that are spilling over in, our, in, 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 in a channel that we're using to measure a certain um, fluorochrome, right? And um, if we remove all the, let's say, offending signals, all the spillover signals, we end up with the actual signal of the fluorochrome that we want to measure, right? So that's why it's called correcting spillover. But in, in reality, what we're really doing with compensation and unmixing is trying to measure the true signal coming from the dye that we want to measure in that particular channel, right? And so what we do is we run single stain controls. So in this case, for instance, we use uh, per CP 5.5 to measure how much signal is actually uh, spilling over into PSI 7 in this case, right? In the PSI 7 channel. And, and so what we try to do is we subtract that signal, and this is done after um, uh, acquisition, right, after the measurement, so it's a post-acquisition um, uh, processing of data, um, and we subtract, and then the medians will match uh, for both the negative and positive populations. So we know that we didn't add PSI 7, so these two populations have to be equally negative for um, PSI 7, right? So then we, we find the true measurement of PSI 7 when we add it. Now, there are, um, and this is something that, 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 that people typically confuse, there are two concepts here that are completely different from each other. And it's very important to understand. One thing is to, comp is to do compensation, to correct for the spillover, right? Another thing is spread, right? And spread is really the thing that we are concerned about because that impacts the quality of our data, right? And, and our panel. And, and for instance, you can see here that um, we have a lot of spread and this spread is coming from the measurement, right? Um, I mean, whether we correct it or not um, with, with compensation, the detectors are still detecting these photons and these photons are entering the detector and, and, and creating noise, right? And so uh, the spread comes from these photons where, you know, in this case, we, we're not supposed to be seeing any photons coming into the PSI7 uh, channel because we didn't add any PSI7, but there are photons coming from per CP5.5, right? So the spread was already there. And actually, if I go back, um, you can see since this is in a log scale, the spread was already there. And, and it's more obvious here in this, in this table that the spread existed in the non compensated um, uh, sample, then when you compensate it, um, there's still the same amount of spread, right? So compensation doesn't correct for, for spread. The spread is introduced um, um, 
in the measurement. So if you have a lot of spread that impacts your data, so let's say you need, um, you know, you have a very dim population here that you require um, good resolution, probably this amount of spread is not going to be, um, is, is going to be too much and it will impact the, the quality of your, of your, you know, separation. So um, what you really want to do is go back and rethink your panel um, based on, on the spread. And you can, for instance, do this with single stain controls and look at all of the channels with all of your single stain controls and to measure the amount of, of uh, spreading that, that's being introduced, okay? And speaking of spreading, the, um, you know, the question that comes a lot, and, and this is something that, that, that really blows my mind, um, is you know, whether you um, should accept uh, spillover values or compensation values above 100%. And, and the answer is uh, a resounding yes. Um, the um, percentage of compensation that you're using um, is, um, does not impact the quality of, of your data uh, or is not related directly with the quality of your data. The, the, um, what impacts the quality of the, your data is the spread. Right, the spread that's introduced by using, um, you know, a suboptimal um, combination of fluorochromes that are spilling over into other channels. Right, and here's a nice example where um, you have um, data that was measured with a certain voltage, and you got a 44% compensation value or spillover value. And then, if you actually change the voltage, um, you have a spillover value of 165. But if you look at the spread, the spread is exactly the same. Why? Because the detector is still measuring the same amount of photons, and, um, and so the error that's introduced is still going to be the same, regardless of the value that is required to correct for that spillover, right? So it's a completely different um, thing altogether. And here's another example where actually you have two similar compensation values or spillover values, uh, but actually here the spread is much higher, right? Again, this is what's important for you to troubleshoot. Uh, regardless, the compensation values could be 800%, 1,000%. Has um, uh, There's no problem in that what you really need to make sure. So if you had 800% compensation here, but this spread, then you're good, right? There's not, um, there isn't a problem at all. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the a lot of the problems that arise from, um, uh, let's say, um, undercompensation or overcompensation, et cetera, actually uh, come from the fact that we don't, or we haven't followed one or more of the three uh, rules of, of, of um, proper compensation controls. And, and I took this slide from, from Mario Rota's presentation, where I think it explains it very well. I'm going into details, but you know, the rules are the, um, you need to use identical fluorochromes for your controls that you will use with your samples, the background of the fluorescence of the two populations, the negative and positive in your control, uh, the autofluorescence has to be the same and the signal um, of the positive population of your control needs to be as bright or brighter than, than, your, than your sample, right? And without going into much details, I invite you to, again, go to our website and, um, you know, we have at least um, a few uh, post-its where, um, where we explain the impact um, uh, on your data of not following um, each of these rules. Um, the, um, and of course, uh, you know, you will have problems with compensation um, if you don't follow one or more of these rules um, or if you don't follow best practices. And, and part of the, um, some of the best practices is to treat the controls the same way as the sample. And this is not something um, specific with full cytometry. It's, 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 it's you know, general to any um, um, field of science. Um, and, and in particular with, with, um, with compensation, um, if you fix the sample, you need to fix the controls also, whether it's FMOs actually, or, or the single stain controls, um, et cetera. So yes, even if your uh, controls are beads, right? We have to um, um, basically run or acquire um, all of your controls and the fluorochromes uh, in the same conditions as you will um, because uh, as you will with your sample, because you remember uh, if you if you um, saw the, the lecture by by uh, Derek Davis yesterday, uh, he actually mentioned that you know fixation permeabilization have an impact on, on fluorochromes and their spectral properties, right? So you want to make sure that everything is the same. We're comparing apples to apples, and if you transfect your cells, for instance, ideally using mock transfect to you for your controls um, would be best. But of course, sometimes people don't have access to that, and that's understandable. You can use a, a, a non-stain or wild type uh, in this case, um, but but again, you know. 
the better controls you have, the better quality of data you will have. Um, now, having said this, there are circumstances where you can't use exactly the same um, uh, conditions as your, you know, in your controls as in your samples. And, and this is just um, a, a little parenthesis here where, um, you know, if we're using brilliant uh, or super bright fluorochromes, um, we need to use a brilliant buffer or the super bright buffer. And, and this is something taken from a Thermo Fisher's website where it, it you know, it, it says um, very clearly that the super bright staining buffer is not compatible with the ultra comp e beads. Um, so basically, you will um, run into problems if you use a super bright buffer uh, for those, uh, if you're using those beads. So um, something to avoid and also something to um, take into consideration because there will be interaction between these fluorochromes if you don't use the brilliant buffer. So if, again, if you're using more than one brilliant buffer in your sample, uh, make sure um, sorry, um, um, brilliant fluorochrome in your sample, make sure to use the brilliant buffer, um, but don't use it for your compensation controls. Um, now, another major um, thing that comes up very uh, often is um, a compensating um, by eye, right? So uh, just the fact that we call it tweaking compensation um, already gives um, you know, um, a very strong signal that this is anything but, but scientific, right? And, and in fact, um, tweaking is, is um, uh, manipulating the data. So it's, it's a form of fraud, right? So you can say it's fraudulent to, to change your, your data. Think of it this way. Um, what if you didn't have a tool, um, and this really, um, you know, I've been very vocal with a lot of vendors. Um, it still strikes me that, you know, vendors still sell um, the software that allows you to tweak compensation by hand, um, and 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 actually sometimes they use it as a, you know, as a way to boost their their sales um, by showing, hey, by the way, this software is really nice because we can change uh, manually compensation. Um, now think of it this way: um, what if you didn't have those tools, right? Um, what if you change the compensations or the the, the data by uh, by using Photoshop? Would this be acceptable? No, of course not, right? So what you're doing is exactly the same when you tweak your compensation, um, when you change those those values in the in the compensation matrix. So, um, and and the problem is, you know, people feel very comfortable because they they want to see the data nicely. But you know, the problem is that um, when you change one of the spillover values, they're all dependent in each other on each other, and so adjusting one manually will impact the others. So this is the first thing that you have to take into account. And then there are many other problems, like um, I, would, I would like to show a lot of examples, but here's just one example taken from um, uh, a NOMIP from uh, Thomas Lichty and, and, and Mario Roder, where they actually, um, you know, if you look at this data, you would see that, you know, there are several instances here that the data seems to be undercompensated, right? So the, the you know, the temptation here would be to just tweak them and, and get to something like this. Now, the problem is actually, as you see here, um, things are changing just, just because they're changing the amount of, of, of uh, chemokine. So basically they, <clears throat> what, they, what they found was that there was um, an interaction between two antibodies, the anti-CXCL13 and the um, anti-IL8 uh, uh, antibodies that were cross-reacting. And, and so you're basically looking at double positives. So it wasn't a spillover, it was just double positives. And, and so if they had done what most people uh, do uh, to correct things by, by eye, they would have um, uh, committed um, you know, a grave mistake and, and actually um, alter the data. And again, this could be considered fraudulent, right? So be careful with that. Um, um, the other um, use of, of, um, of single stain controls is, the, um, is to assess the quality of panel design. This is something I learned from Maria Hymas uh, when she was still in, in BT and, and now at SciTech. And this is a very nice way um, to, to be able to understand uh, what is the impact of your, of, your, of your panel, of your fluorochrome choices on your data. And this you can do by comparing the single stain control. So we're talking about uh, staining cells, right? Um, and then comparing those same cells with the fully stained. So here's an example where um, looking at the single stain, if you concentrate yourself on the negative, um, you can see that 
um, when you have a single the single stain in this case and you and you compare it with the fully stain, um, there is no impact on the negative uh, population. So there's no with all the fluorochromes together, there's no impact on 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 that negative population, uh, no increase in spread, etc. And and you can see in the overlay that they match pretty nicely. Now in some cases you may um, you know when you add all the rest of the fluorochromes, you can see that there's an increase in spread of the negative, meaning that there's a lot of impact from um, um, other fluorochromes spilling over into this particular channel, and then you end up with um, something much more spread. So this will help you troubleshoot, and you can say, well, if I do need um, high resolution here in this channel, maybe this increase in, in, in uh, spread is going to be bad. So I might rethink um, which is the uh, fluorochrome that's, um, that's really impacting this and, and change my, my panel. Right, so it's. I think it's a very nice way of of troubleshooting your panel afterwards, and finally, um, the other type of control that we typically um, um, uh, use um, is the fluorescence minus one, um, meaning that you add all of your antibodies with all the fluorochromes except one, and this is. Probably, probably no, this is the best um, by far. It's not perfect, but it's by far the best control for, um, for, the, for determining the threshold between negative and positive, right? Um, helps you to identify these boundaries, uh, but also helps you to, um, uh, to find um, a potential impact of spillover. And I'll show you an example. So just to give you a very quick um, um, example of what an FMO control is. So here we have a completely unstained. So if we would use a completely unstained uh, control to set the boundaries for the CD4PE, we would set it here, correct? Um, but as we add all of the other antibodies except uh, uh, CD4PE, um, we notice that actually the negative population spreads, right? Because we, we have the influence maybe from PSI5 or PSI7 spilling over into the PE channel. Um, but we know this is not positive for, for PE because we haven't added CD4PE, right? So if we use this um, um, as our threshold, or as our boundary, you see that in the actual sample, now it makes sense because with the unstained, we were actually cutting part of the negative population and considering it as positive, right? So the FMO control is very good for that. And actually, um, even if you haven't really corrected uh, your spillover correctly, um, um, the FMO actually takes into that, uh, that into account, right? So here's an example where, you know, if it's well compensated, you would set your FMO gate and everything looks nice. But here's um, an example where um, the compensation is off by 20% and still the FMO will tell you where the right boundary is. Um, and you can still, um, um, you know, um, be able to set your, your boundaries appropriately. And finally, uh, one of the, the best uses of FMOs is actually while you're um, uh, optimizing your panel and trying to identify um, which are the fluorochromes that are really impacting the, the, the quality and the resolution um, of your data. And here's just an example of a fully stained where, you know, seeing the um, CD127 uh, signal, which is very spread and, and squashed here in the axis, and we don't have a very good resolution here. So, um, you know, what, what they did in this case was they ran, they looked at the FMO controls of all of the fluorochromes and, um, and when they looked at the CD4 uh, per CPSI 5.5 FMO, they realized that, oh, now we have much better resolution. So in fact, it was the per CPSI 5.5 spilling over into the um, PSI 7 channel, right? So this is a nice way of troubleshooting. And, and in fact, it's, it's always advised that every time you're building a panel, um, um, you know, run all of the FMO controls. Yes, maybe you have 30 colors, run the 30 FMOs um, when you're, uh, building and optimizing the panel. Once you have that optimized, you can start looking at, you know, maybe in this case, you know, for CD4, we really don't need an FMO because, um, you know, it's pretty obvious where the negative and the positive arise. Even then, I would be very cautious because there may be situations, especially when you're working with uh, human samples um, and human patients, um, you will be surprised with the amount of um, diversity that, that exists in outbred um, uh, mammals uh, like humans, um, where you have a lot of variability, right? So some cases it may really 
uh, pull apart. And in other cases, uh, it may not pull apart. And if you don't have an FMO, you may struggle a lot with it. So um, I don't know if I've gone off time, um, but I just want to thank, um, you know, obviously my team, um, my wonderful team has been very supportive and contributed to a lot of data that you just saw now. Um, we will have this recorded on YouTube, so you'll be able to go through the slides more, more calmly and, and, and check the references. And, um, and I'll also like to, again, thank Flotex. Um, it's been a, a, you know, a really pleasure to work with you guys. Um, uh, since the pandemic, we started uh, doing a lot of webinars and um, uh, together, and, and I've been with Flotex since then. And, and like I said, it's, it's just a fun group to, to hang out with, and, um, and I'm looking forward for the rest of the meeting. Thank you. All right, Roy. Well, thank you very much for that talk. And uh, yeah, we'll have questions uh, when the, all the speakers are finished. All right, it is an enormous pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Yolanda uh, Menke. Uh, she was first introduced to flow cytometry during her PhD at the German Cancer Research Center where she studied T-cell memory and murine models. Yolanda is a recipient of the now prestigious Mary Lou Ingram Scholar from the, uh, from the International Society for Advancement of Cytometry, our, our society, ISAC and remains an active member in ISAC's committees today. Currently, she's the founder and CEO of Flow, Flow Know How LLC, a consultant company for, for flow cytometry with, with a focus on immunology and clinical trials, while in parallel performing duties as an associate editor for Cytometry Part A. Yolanda has extensive experience with developing multi-parameter panels to study clinical trial samples to investigate the immune system in health and disease, infectious disease oncology, including CAR T cells, while working with uh, Dr. Mario Roderer, which many of us know, at NIH's Vaccine Research uh, Center. She later worked with Professor Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania. Her efforts uh, required were re Hard to establish reliable multicolor immunofluorescence panel from scratch, led her to develop a clear methodology that was published and lectured on extensively. 2010, with, in, together with colleagues, the VRC, and in close collaboration with Cyto Part A, Yolanda developed a novel publication, pla publication platform to encourage and share of optimized uh, multicolor immunofluorescence panels, otherwise known as OMIPS, and she will be talking about that today. So Yolanda, the virtual floor is yours and we look forward to this talk. Thank you so much, David, for the uh, beautiful introduction. Hello, everyone. And also thank you for the invitation to speak at Flowtex virtual this year. It's a great honor for me. Um, I will be talking about the anatomy of OMIPS, not only for those of you who are interested in publishing their own uh, panel, but also to highlight the usefulness of this resource in order to accelerate panel development in your own lab. I need to point out that I co-developed the OMIP publication platform, as David mentioned, together with Mara Ruderer and Pratip Chattopadhyay, and that I am currently Cytometry Part A's associate editor for OMIP. So if you have any specific questions for something you might want to publish, you'll be probably be talking to me. So what is an OMIP? Um, let's see here. So OMIP, of course, stands for Optimized Multicolor Immunified Phenotyping Panels. Um, this is a specialized publication type in cytometry part A that has been around for just a little over 10 years now. Um, and it was designed for the dissemination of optimized panels for any polychromatic fluorescence-based method, as well as mass cytometry. So that includes, obviously, flow cytometry and mass cytometry, but also techniques such as fluorescence microscopy, image cytometry, and intravitral microscopy. The idea behind OMIPS is that they reduce the panel development time for researchers in need for um, using similar panels. Um, they provide a starting point for the creation of normal, novel OMIPS, and they give panel developers credit by citation of their publications. It is important to note that any panel that is being adopted in your lab needs to be tested and optimized for use in your particular experimental settings, even when using an OMIP. So just because somebody already worked it out and it works great in their hands doesn't mean that you can translate it 100% to your lab because there are always little things that, that are different uh, in the machinery, in the buffers you use, et cetera. Um, so you just want to make sure that it works correctly as, as published. 
while the average number of parameters measured by any given OMIP has obviously seen an, uh, an overall rise over the years, which was prompted by the diversification of available fluorochromes and advances in high parameter instrumentation, the complexity of a panel does not guarantee that it qualifies as an OMIP, nor is complexity required for a very high complexity. So as an example, OMIP 40 only includes six parameters, six fluorescent parameters, but it addresses an important niche, namely the evaluation of cellular subpopulations in the human prostate and fulfills other OMIP requirements. And so that's why it was accepted as an OMIP. So what are the requirements then to qualify as an OMIP? Clearly optimization is key. It's in the name, right? So you can't go past that. What does this mean? Rui already gave you a good uh, base, basis for, um, for things that you need to do in order to get good signals um, and reliably detect different markers uh, without, without one impacting the other. Um, it, it means basically, optimization basically means that the panel needs to appropriately address the biological question that it is designed for. In this regard, the biology will inform the, the marker selection. The region performance under specific experimental conditions needs to be evaluated. So if you need to um, stimulate cells, for example, does that impact marker expression? Um, do you need to extract cells from a tissue? Does association of the tissue impact expression of certain markers? Such things will need to be tested um, and, and shown that you can still measure everything that you set out to measure. You should test alternative clones and or fluorochrome conjugates um, in order to see whether you can increase uh, detection or, or improve detection of, of your markers. And so in that regard, any information that you have re regarding the relative molecular density of markers, as well as the fluorochrome stain index will help with selecting regions to start testing putative panels. Every Luch, as Rui also mentioned, will address part of this in, um, later on in this session. So every, everybody's already on the edge of the seats to, uh, to see what you have to, to tell us about that. And of course, the optics of the cytometer you are using, including the detector sensitivities, will dictate which fluorochromes can even be considered for inclusion. And finally, last but not least, the existing OMIPs will be able to, or potentially can, can already help you in, in figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what might be good combinations, uh, what issues that other developers run into, et cetera. So it's always worth looking at the OMIPs before setting out to, to, to develop a new panel in your lab. So when you're, when you're looking at an OMA publication, you will notice that it consists of a, a print portion and an online portion. Both of these are very important. You can think of the print portion as a billboard, while the online portion provides all the important details that is required for someone to replicate the panel and its performance. Both parts contain mandatory elements, as well as plenty of space for personalization. For the purpose of this talk, I will focus on flow cytometry panels, but the requirements for all OMIPs differ only in a few details as dictated by a given technique. In the following, I'll, I will provide examples taken from OMIP 70, which was co-developed by today's keynote speaker, Florian Meyer. So let's take a closer look then at the anatomy of OMIPs, and we'll start with the print portion, which outlines what the panel is all about. Thus, it tells you something about the cell type, the cell origin, if applicable, and the disease state also um, that it was designed for. So for example, T cells from pancreatic tumor tissue. It will also specify the species that the panel was designed for. Um, and currently we actually have a nice variety of OMIPs um, for, for cells from human mouse, including humanized mouse, rat, non-human primate, and dog. It will tell you which specific markers are included and why they were included. And also mention what the presented panel adds to similar previously published OMIPs where applicable. So if you're, um, if you're presenting a panel for a completely new cell type that hasn't, doesn't have an OMIP yet, obviously you can't 
um, mention that. But if you're talking about NK cells, there are already a number of NK cell panels out there. So we'll need to um, mention those and discuss what your panel adds over those already existing. And last but no, not least, you'll provide a pretty picture uh, showing the representative staining and gating for, um, for your panel. So in addition to discussing these elements in the text, the print portion of any OMIP will include three mandatory items. Um, this includes table one, which uh, is basically a summary of the what. So it'll tell you about the purpose of the panel listed at the top here, which in this case is the immunophenotyping of human NK cells and tumor tissues. It'll tell you which species it's designed for, human in this case, which cell types it has been developed for and optimized for. In this case, um, it was developed and optimized for both tumor tissues and peripheral blood. And then lastly, it tells you what other OMEPs address similar cells. Um, and it just lists, in this case, it lists seven different OMIPs and in the um, text typically, it will tell you what this adds um, over and above what those seven OMIPs are already doing. So at one glance, in this little table, you can already figure out how relevant this OMIP might be to what you're interested in. Next is table two which expands on that information a little bit more and um, provides detailed information regarding the reagents used in the OMIP. For each panel reagent, it will list the specificity on the very left. It will provide alternative names used for those. So um, NKBP46, for example, is also known as CD335 and one, some publica publications only use one versus the other and some labs one nomenclature is, is more common than the other. So it always helps to provide alternative names for the, the markers that you're looking at. This table will also give you the, the specific clone that is used for every marker, as well as the fluorochrome and the reason for including that marker in this panel. So the, the panel, the, the purpose, is it there to, to exclude cells that you're not interested in um, or to exclude dead cells? Is it there to hone in on specific, um, on major subpopulations like B cells, T cells, NK cells, et cetera, or for migration? Is it a migration marker, proliferation marker? All these kinds of things are, would be listed in the rightmost column. This takes us to the third mandatory element, and that is figure one, which is typically the only figure in the print portion of an OMIP. And it gives you a full overview of the staining performance of the panel, as well as the, the detailed gating that will lead you to uh, address the scientific question that the panel was, um, was developed for. So this should include all the pre-gating, in other words, a time gate, um, a light scatter gate, singlet gates, exclusion of dead cells, um, et cetera. Anything that can clean up your data and, and remove any background um, or noise, um, reagent aggregates, such things, before you get to even looking at your different cell populations and then looking at expression of, of certain markers on those subpopulations, on those cellular populations. In the, in the present panel in OMIP 70, the, the authors also provided this really nice graph um, uh, that, that shows the expression of all the pertinent markers on their um, cell type of interest, which in this case were NK cells. And so they're looking at all the different um, markers that they were interested in, in terms of activation, inhibition, migration, etc., cetera, um, and providing the staining or a representative staining for the three different cell types they were looking at, or uh, cell sources, should I say. So from tumor cells, uh, from tumor tissue, matched PBMC, and healthy control PBMC. So this is really useful information when you're trying to translate this or transfer this OMIP into your lab and you're interested maybe not in, in tumor uh, patients, but in, in healthy PBMC or, or PBMC um, in an infectious disease setting or 
you know, from or in case cells from different types of tissues, you can always look at this and see, okay, this is the kind of um, expression that I'm that I could expect for different types of tissues. So now let's talk about the online portion. There's nothing supplementary about this part. So that's why I never refer to this as supplementary um, information. It's, it's the online part. And this is really the heart of any OMIP. This is where you get all the important technical details that, is re that are required to replicate a panel. Um, and it'll also provide detailed information regarding the optimization process um, used to generate that panel. So this is where you will learn what worked and what didn't which is invaluable information when working to develop your own OMIP that includes some of the same markers. So even if it's quite different, but you're using, you know, one like Chi-67, whether it's used for, for NK cells, for T cells, for, for B cells, for, you know, it probably has, the regions have similar issues. So if the, the authors give you some information on it didn't work with this kind of buffer, it performed better with that kind of fluorochrome, that will be very inf important and valuable information for you. So you don't have to try the same things and waste time and money um, on, on doing, on just replicating. Um, so the, the online portion will give you details about the flow cytometer optics. The commercial staining reagents used any in-house conjugates and, or tandem dyes that were used um, provide you in detailed information on region titrations, the optimization strategy, any other reagents such as buffers used, and then finally an easy to follow full step-by-step -step protocol. Online table one provides you the, the online, uh, the, I'm sorry, the instrument configuration. Um, any, any panel is always developed for on one specific type of instrumentation. Um, and this table will give you all the details about that, that instrument that it was developed for. So it'll provide the laser wavelength and laser power, as well as the optical filters used and which fluorochrome was detected on any given um, detector in, for the, in, in this panel. Um, I would like to highlight, so you always, we have a column here for the name of a detector, which is a way to refer to it um, when discussing optimization in the text. And I would like to highlight the way um, the authors of this, of this homework chose to name their, their detectors, which I find very useful um, and they are using basically they're indicating with the first letter here the laser line um, and then the number gives you the median wavelength that is detected and in, in that particular detector so when you're when you're reading the text and you see a detector name it is very easy for you to um, to figure out which fluorochrome should be detected in uh, in that detector um, and which fluorochromes might provide um, might result in, in issues of like spillover and, and spreading that you might need to worry about or that you might need to consider as we pointed out when you're trying to detect very dim fluorochromes or rare markers. So online table two lists all the commercial staining reagents that were used in the panel. It essentially expands on the information that was provided in the print table two um, leaving away the alternative marker names and the purpose of the marker's inclusion in the panel, but just specifying uh, all the um, more technical details, should I say, specifying now the, the vendor and the catalog number, but also the titer that was used. And if there are any special staining conditions that would also be provided here. So if you're doing intracellular staining as well as extracellular staining, that will be given here or if uh, antibodies are used during, um, during a stimulation or incubated at 37 degrees versus room temperature or on ice, all that could be indicated here. If everything is stained in one single staining step, obviously we don't need that extra column. So then online figure, figure one will um, provide the region titrations. 
as we pointed out, titration is absolutely mandatory uh, when you want to develop a good uh, optimized panel. And so, so the OMIPS do require you to show the titration a detailed serial dilution series for every single region that you include in the final panel and to highlight in this figure which titer was chosen. I always encourage people to include a completely unstained uh, sample in these concatenated plots because it does tell you um, whether addition of your reagent already impacts the negative population, even at low concentrations, which can happen. So <clears throat> this is then where it gets interesting. Informa information regarding the optimization steps undertaken. Any OMIP will include a detailed discussion of the optimization strategy, highlighting what worked and what didn't, and why certain reagents were selected over others. You'll find other pertinent information here too. Um, the, the authors of OMEP 70 and others as well have provided a table that actually lists all the reagents, um, or other reagents that they tested as alternatives for, for those that were included in the final panel. So they tell you the specificity in pluricrome and the specific clone for those, and also the reason why they were finally excluded, which is really, really uh, very useful information when you're trying to develop your own panel. Very importantly, um, an OMIP, every OMIP should also illustrate some of the optimization steps undertaken. Not every single one of them, obviously, then you know, you'll know you publish a book for every OMIP, but um, some of the important steps should be highlighted, um, which includes uh, any alternative staining reagents that were tested. In the present example, the authors tested three different NKP46 um, antibodies, uh, conjugated to either BB711, BB605, or um, with, conjugated to biotin and then revealed with streptavidin BB630, and compared this in the, in a, total of six different panels. So it's important if you compare reagents, not to just compare that individual reagent, but to compare it in, um, in the context of the full panel or at least a partial panel so that you can also evaluate impact of other reagents that are in the panel on, on the detection of, of your uh, reagents of, of the marker in question. So in this case, NKP46. So I mentioned um, testing, uh, testing out your different um, experimental conditions. So if you're, if you're fixing cells, if you're simulating cells, et cetera, maybe you want to test different fixatives if you're having issues detecting some of the markers. Um, in this case, since the, the panel was developed for NK cells from tumor tissue, the authors did address whether uh, treating cells with collagenase impacts the detection of, uh, of any of their markers. And they did this uh, just testing PBMC since they're, they're easier to get to. Um, and they compared the detection of all of their markers on untreated versus collagenase treated PBMC and saw that they can satisfactorily detect all of the markers that they set, set out to detect. So none of them was significantly impacted, which is important to know and to show. So this pretty much sums up what OMIPs are all about. Um, if this makes you think now, hold on, well, I have this great panel that I could just uh, share with the community. Make sure before you send it in for consideration that it meets the following requirements. It is novel. Um, you know, it, it fulfills some, some niche that hasn't been addressed yet. So it could be building on existing OMIPs. So but if you're adding some crucial element to it, and a new marker that has been shown to be really important in a specific setting, um, that, that, could be, that could be novel enough. So that is always evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. It has to have, since it's a multicolor um, panel, it has to have at least five colors or isotypes when we're talking about mass cytometry. 
it must be obviously thoroughly optimized and you have to be able to demonstrate such optimization. It has to be useful to a range of researchers. Um, so, you know, if it's something that only you can use and I don't really know what that would be, but um, then that would probably not qualify as an OWIM. So it should, it should be bringing something to the community as well. And all reagents must be publicly available. So if you're including some in-house reagents, that's fine. If you're, if you're happy to share them, if somebody asks, um, or, you know, sometimes you run out, obviously then it doesn't mean that you can't share the OMIP, but you then provide, you, you must anyways provide all the information necessary to replicate, to generate that reagent. Um, so, you know, what ratio did you use for creating a tandem dye for um, conjugating your antibody, et cetera. Um, if you're using custom reagents, those must also be available to everyone else. Um, so finally, there, I would like to point you towards the, some resources. There are, um, the OMIP guidelines are in this uh, paper that I'm listing here. It, we published it in two, uh, 2010 when we first started the OMIPs. And it has all the, basically everything that we talked about now, all the, the mandatory elements, the different tables and figures that need to be included. Um, so, so do go ahead and um, read that prior to submitting any OMIP manuscript. And then there's uh, an OMIPS collection that uh, Wiley has on their, on their website, and they provide uh, a little summary, a short summary of what OMIPS are about, and then um, go on to give you all the, the links to all the currently published um, OMIPS, and of course they add any new ones in as they as they um, get accepted and published. And finally, if you have any additional questions, we will have a roundtable discussion at the end of the session, so after this talk, um, and if even after that you you might come up with follow up questions, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm I'm listing here my uh, email address flownowhow at gmail.com, or you can contact me through my website at www.flownowhow.com. Um, and thank you for your attention, and I'll pass this back to David. All right, thank you very much, Yolanda. That was an excellent talk. Okay, keeping things moving, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Hervé Luche. Uh, is well known in the field of flow cytometry and immunology. Hervé uh, studied developmental biology, his doctoral and postdoctoral work during which he engineered uh, knockout strains to address lineage commitment issues and acquired extensive experience in high multi-parametric multi -parametric flow cytometry. In 2012, he joined the CIPHE, which is the Center for Immunophenomics in Marseille, Lumine, um, to lead a team of engineers in the immunophenotyping uh, module that was going on there. Here, he directs the operations of standardized methodologies, functional assays, and high content cytometry panels of leukocytes to establish a status of immune system at basal inflammatory oncology or infectious con uh, conditions in in control or mutant animals. Herve has also been a contributor to the national international phenotyping effort and is also a long, long time member of ISAC and is also a, a, a past ISAC scholar. Herve's talk today will be about these latest efforts in phenotyping and the title of his talk is Dynamic Antigen Density of Murine Leukocytes, a Crucial Step Toward Rational Panel Design. And we're looking forward to that talk, Herve. Thank you very much. So oh, do you see my screen? Is this okay? okay. So uh, thanks for the invitation to speak uh, at Protect. Uh, it's actually a very nice uh, community. I'm, I'm, I'm regularly interacting with, so I'm happy to be there. And also to Uri and Yolanda, because they introduced lots of the concepts that I'm actually showing here and, and putting into application. So as you understood, uh, we're going to talk about the dynamic antigen density. And I want to show you how we, we did this work. First of the thing is why rational panel design? Well, it's all deal with this is to find a CD marker that best decipher the cell population that we are interested in. And, and basically, with regular flow, it's going to be this. We try to match some guys uh, with markers that allow you to define your population. Having said this, uh, what, which antibody fluorocombination should I use? So there are rules. Actually, this one is not the good one. 
uh, it's uh, the one that is traditionally being done. So don't use the one you have in the fridge and try your cocktail out. You have to follow rules that actually have been defined by Yolanda and Mario Roderer. So, uh, and it's very, very nicely, uh, there's a paper where it's nicely described. So you need first to define some primary uh, markers that are easily classified between positive and negative, like CD3, CD4, and MCD8. So this is very easy to define. Uh, so you will, you will be able to use uh, maybe combination that, that are not so bright for different lens. Then secondary is that the, the ones that are well characterized express at higher density, over often over a continuum, and you might need to actually preserve uh, dim and high signals. And then the tertiary are the ones that are at the low level expressed or uncharacterized, and you really want to save uh, for any influence from coming from step data. And I would add another class, which is a quaternary, and this we can now, because of the instrument we get, uh, we can increase the number of parameters. These are not essential, but they are very important to have in your panel because that will increase the robustness of the detection of your population. And obviously, as you, you learned from we, you need to match uh, expression on gene density with uh, brightness of your fluorochromes, and this is directly uh, depend dependent on your instrument. So uh, as I said, the knowledge of antigen density is important actually to know what is right or not. Um, and that's what I'm gonna, gonna present to you today is the work that we've been doing on, on mouse, uh, with, together with DD Bioscience, knowing that in human, the, the data set is already available. And the last thing I, I want to say is that you, you should avoid spreading heavy combination. We've been talking about this already. Um, and my last comment would be that very bright is not always best. So because you, you might increase uh, set data in, in, the, in the very bright uh, range. So you, you, you can reduce these issues by using something less bright. And, um, and just to say that, if you think um, what I'm going to talking about today is completely, you know, a uh, side thing because of uh, the new type of instrumentation we have in, in the field now, like the spectral analyzer or the mass cytometer or the single cell genomics. Well, I will show you it's completely wrong. Um, first thing is that, uh, as we said, uh, composite configuration of the instrument is important, but when you go to biological sample and population of interest, uh, uh, antigen density is really important, for example, in spectral. If you use something super bright on a super expressed molecule, uh, and if you use traditional approach that flow cytometers do is that dimming a bit down your detector, you will reduce the sensitivity for a lot of dyes uh, in the spectral signature, so it's not a good idea. And then for genomic cytometry, if you just use antibodies that are super strongly expressed and together with uh, weakly expressed ones, you will compete your risk uh, of the sequencing will be in competition and you will see a lot of risk for your highly expressed molecules. So it's also not such a good idea. So you need to really know that and also know the marker to expression and dynamic of expression for that. And there are tools that are there um, uh, in the field. So this one is the DVD, there is Flourish and so on. But the thing is that they don't take into account this information. So we are kind of left uh, there and, and we, need, we need to get information from somewhere. And that's the purpose of this project. So as we said, we need to match brightness with antigen density. But uh, yeah, where do I find this info? Um, it's actually uh, since uh, sometimes now in human, it's available in the mouse, it, it was not there. So um, the issue is that it's based on a priori knowledge of the scientists. Most of the time, this knowledge is actually limited to the co-expression of some markers, and then uh, we don't know on other subsets. And now that we really look broad, uh, it's, it's an issue. Then we don't know if this information is valid, valid in inflammatory conditions, because most of the time, the data that is there around is actually in, on steady state uh, conditions. And then it's pretty tricky when, it's, uh, when it comes to the monitoring or activation markers, because uh, if you use basal, you won't see them because your immune system is not activated. So you need an intense mine, data mining uh, full of literature to find information. And if your boss is fan of exotic markers, then you will have uh, some issues. It will take, take some time. So the idea was to, to generate data set that will be useful for the community to speed up this step. And, and, and that's basically coming from a collaboration together with Bob Balderas, who actually got the idea of doing this. And I, I really acknowledge him for that. Uh, and I have to say also another talented scientist that used to work at Swiss, who is Ken Santamaria, who actually did this work. So the aim is to quantify the density of all CD cell surface molecules in the mouse. 
And we took all available reagents in the catalog from BD Bioscience and Biology. So it's actually quite expensive. Then we looked at basal, but as I said to you, uh, uh, the basal in the mouse, for example, there are some markers that are not expressed. And they might actually endanger your panel if you don't take this into account. So we actually did two inflammatory conditions. One is an adaptive trigger with an anti cd injected in vivo before the takedown of the animal. These abrogulate markers of exertion of T cells. And another one is a 9 a trigger, the poly IC, which mimics a non uh, viral infection, which uh, is part of particular important today. Uh, and we, what we want to do is to provide the information in antibody bind per cell and not in MFI so that we can transpose this information to whatever type of instrument that is flow, spectral, or mass. Um, so the major goals are to help in final design by establishing strengthening of all CD markers for all the cell population we have seen in, in the study, and also establish a list of core stress markers because that was one of the really strong points in final design. You need to know these core stress markers. And also the dynamics, because here we, we're going to do some discovery as well on the biology in the mouth, and the dynamic of, uh, of surface expression of markers. So that's the principle. So we use a, a Fortessa with very high power laser on the PE, 100 milliwatt, and this to optimize the detection of very dimly expressed molecules. We use quantified system from the beads to quantify the number of molecules. Uh, these beads have a known uh, number of PE molecules grafted on them. So you can do a basic regression between uh, correlation, sorry, between MFI, you measure from each type of beads, and fluorescence, you measure on your instrument to define the number of molecules. And then we also have bit size standards. We use a, a multi-parameter flow panel, uh, 16 colors. We can look at this number of population. Um, we use a lot, a lot of antibodies, and we have two conditions. And that's the numbers. Uh, we did biological replicate. It's also to take this into account. Only one gender, only the, the scene. Uh, and that's 428 finally in the program. And uh, we use always one microgram of amount of antibodies. So it's about 5,000 data points that has been generated in the course of this study. So it's quite massive. Um, the assets set up now. So we, we really wanted to, to do something that uh, people uh, will really trust. And, and for me, uh, this needs a lot of control. So we, we spend a lot of time doing the assay. And actually, it's actually very nice because uh, what we introduced to you, we actually use. So first, we did a brightness index on the new instrument that will be used for this project uh, to actually know what is bright and not. Um, and we derived this ranking, and then we could use that for assigning uh, the dye we would use in the panel for uh, the ADM project onto our machine. And then we looked at the spread data as well, and we really tried to minimize uh, the really dead, uh, the really evil uh, red part here, and, and be more in the blue part to ease uh, the resolution, to improve the resolution of what we are looking at. And, and that's how we came up to this panel that uh, I think Yolanda, we, we, we need to publish as a nominee, um, also because it will uh, actually lighten the, the paper on this on this data set. Uh, is, uh, so we can look at T cell, B cell, NK cell, B cell, myel myeloid cells uh, with these. So it's a, a combination of single uh, dyes as well as some that are in, in multiplex uh, together. So like CD8 with, with CD8 S and LY6 with CD5. And that allow us to actually uh, look at a lot of population with uh, clear resolution. So that's the gating strategy here uh, that we use. And we get on light side singlet, and then we look at all these. Now, uh, we talked about FMO. That's the FMO. Uh, and they are very important here because we see that some of the population we are looking at, they don't have the same uh, the same um, heat in the PE. So we, we take this into account when we calculate the poor ABC of the same population. Um, and and I, here just to, to decipher to show you the specificity and the sensitivity of the assay, uh, because I'm working in the mice, I have the best control you can dream of, which are knockout mice. So here, a steady state training for this antibody, if you are one in PE, you have an IC, I don't, I don't have signal in the knockout. And then if I modulate the immune system by the body IC inflammation here, six hours, uh, I see this level, and at 16 hours, I see a decrease. And that's actually this. This is um, this information you see from steady state poly IC 16 hours is captured in this data set. So we're going to learn things about activation of cells as well. Then for the quantification, so that's an important valid point here. You, you need to be, because you want to be sure of many mo molecules you have expressed on the surface of a cell. 
uh, you need to, to have, uh, for each molecule, an antibody bound to it. And for this, you need to place yourself into a, a, a range where you have saturating amount of antibody. And that's what, where we actually spend the new regular flow for immunotenotyping. So we defined a saturation uh, level for uh, the anti-CD8, and we, designed, we decided to treat one microgram, and then we applied that with all other molecules. We could not do that for every single molecule, so we tested several ones, and it was actually reached uh, a saturation at this amount. So we extrapolated this for all the molecules. Uh, but one issue is that when you have a super highly expressed uh, molecules like class two LYC3 or CD11B, you see that with one microgram of antibody, we are completely outscaled because we have a very high power laser. So we use a trick of using density filters to actually cut down the signal for this uh, highly expressed molecule. Uh, and we screen first who was, who was super highly expressed, and then we do the measurement with this neutral density filter. So we are really sure about um, uh, also the number of molecules we have on very, very highly expressed molecules. Now, the quality assurance, so make sure everything is working as expected. So for that, we actually uh, have a mixture of different kinds of uh, beads. So uh, we have a quantify for the quantification, but in each of this, in each and every single well acquired in this project, we have the same lot of PSNT beads that was spiked in it. Uh, and this is very useful because like this, we can check hydrophilization with it and also use that for uh, later uh, normalization of the data. Uh, so that's one example here. It's um, all the data points required to uh, the project. And you see that we have a very nice alignment of the CSPI to uh, superfluorescent. But you see sometimes that there are files for which this is not the case. So we can pick them out um, using uh, softwares um, by only looking at the, the PA, the PA uh, of the CSPI. For quantification, as I told you, we have the Z. So each bead have a number of molecules grafted on it, given by the bead, so you can read the MFI, you match it with the number of molecules, you, you draw your uh, linear, uh, your correlation factor, and then you can infer the number of molecules you have on your cell from that, and you use the MFI, UTE, the quantification channel. And then the last thing we did is that we also check everything is based on this concept that for, uh, so that it's linear, you need one fluorochrome per antibody, per protein, so we actually check whether that was true or not. And for this, we actually uh, used uh, combis on which we, um, uh, we put incubate together with a 0.5 microgram of oil antibody using the screen. And if quantification uh, is at an FP to one to one ratio, then we should always get the same kind of uh, mean fluorescent intensity from the beads. And, and that's basically, you see, so it be, behaves quite well. Um, uh, but uh, there are some outliers in, that were in this experiment. We actually repeated it, and it's, uh, I was either gone, so it was a typing mistake, and then we did the experiment, or we changed the antibody lot. And then for the immune system activation, we actually checked on the hematological profile that uh, uh, the inflammation was ongoing normally. So just to tell you this is uh, valid. Um, so now we go to analysis. Uh, how can we do to analyze this? So it's uh, around 5,000 files. Uh, almost a year of acquisition and three meteorological commissions, a lot of different papers to analyze the data. So we wanted to use an unsupervised method to actually analyze the data. So we use CAFOL from um, uh, Federico Gerardini. Uh, the idea is that you take your a manually gated reference population that becomes long mass. Each of your single SCS files, uh, single events are clustered. You do other clustering. And then each of these clusters are matched to uh, all the, the, the closest reference uh, long mass. And like this, you can annotate these clusters and give a name coming from your uh, gated population. And the cool thing about this is that it's, it's uh, based on the cosinus similarity metric. It's not based on signal intensity. It's based on pattern of expression. So uh, even if we look at some situation where we have inflammation, uh, the, the T cell remain a T cell in the in the context of the markers we are looking at. So like this, we can map them. And like this, you can have one single map that actually change across the different inflammation, and then you can uh, capture and annotate your data set, uh, even with these 5,000 data points, which is quite good. Um, what we did is actually, we uh, for the long marks, it's one detail. We actually took 
um, uh, uh, long uh, population that we get it manually from these three conditions so that we, we take into account the variation in, coming from the inflammation. So we, we combine these all and we use them for gating. Then we all, what we also did is that we remove all these dots and um, dimensionality reduction space to actually have only very nicely defined pack of cells. And uh, yeah, and then we use a, a, a simulated method from each test to actually define the number of clusters we need. Right. So we have an algorithm. We, we have a tool to actually help us uh, defining what is the best number of clusters. And for the data set of the ADN, we define 300 well groups. And that's how it's working at the end. You see a nice annotation uh, of neutrophils here. Uh, so this does a good job in capturing the cells from the DNA. And we can build these maps. So now that we have these maps that are spread on throughout the whole project, uh, we can also subtract some information coming from background that might come from isotypes. So we have to define an isotype tool. Uh, and then we can get these maps. So where we see uh, the expression of uh, surface molecules, we can do some ranking, we can see where markers are expressed. We can do uh, also to see whether uh, some population are common or not across inflammation. And you see here all the T cells are there. Then B cells are there, myeloid cells are there across the different inflammation. We can learn some new stuff like here upregulation of CD69 upon poly IC is actually a general mechanism in all cells I've been looked at, and not only like what has been described in T cells and neutrophils. Uh, we also talked about uh, the staining intensity. You need to change clone because it's not so good. And the clone here we have all the clones right from these two big companies. So we see clearly that the signals are actually not the same depending on the clone you use. So it will help also people to take the best clone for their uh, for their study. And then how useful is this even in the genomic era? So that's uh, data from coming from Bob and uh, just two minutes ago. Uh, before this presentation, and you see that we actually use our data set to define an absolute panel uh, that we run, and we claim that we uh, use this database to, to actually help define this absolute panel, so it saved him a month to actually uh, design something very really interesting, because now they spot many functional subsets within this algorithm. And you could think also, because you, you know that, you can think of something like approach, like what we did here, uh, and, and so on. So resources for human cell aficionados, because I, I know in the US, you have lots of uh, people working with human. Uh, so we have the antibody by a study that I said, so it's a mass cytometry that I said that is available, I have the link here. And you have the CD map work together with the work from the EU that is available, if I request that you can interrogate in these two files. So as a conclusion, um, we should compare, uh, you should consider panel design very carefully as a whole process. So we talked about optimal instrument settings. We talked about antibody dye combination, depending on this antigen density. And I hope uh, this data set that we generated will help you in this. Optimal gating strategy that will be defined from that. And that will be helpful for manual analysis, but as well as unsupervised analysis. So this is something that you will have something nice also from the new tools of analysis. Then setting up the instrument is very important according to recommendation uh, to go in higher content panel panels, minimize fuel opportunity uh, when you subsetize your population of cells. Try to respect data, we talked about this. Always test your panel combination, that's evident. And then use application settings so that all what you did in your setup is actually kept over your experimental process. And now that's the people involved in this work. So in the blue, that's the BD folks. In green, that's the key people that were uh, uh, important for that project. And I thank you all for that. All right, thank you, Hervé. Uh, we're gonna move right on to the uh, uh, panel discussion. And because we're slightly late, we need to cut a hard deadline at uh, 10.40. So we're going to go there. Now, don't take it as a personal offense, but my operation is here, but I've got all the questions over here. We've got plenty of questions for all three speakers. Um, so I'm just going to start off. This one came under, under uh, for Rui. Uh, can you use cells instead of beads to voltrate your channels and machines? Yes, that's a good question. I actually forgot to, to put a reference there. Um, there's a nice um, uh, there's a nice poster from 
from um, Anna Brooks and Simon Monard, where they showed that uh, you can use um, the, uh, you know, your unstained cells, because again, you know, what you really want to, to make sure is that at least the alpha fluorescence of your cells that you're analyzing, um, uh, that the signal will be significantly higher than the intrinsic noise. Uh, so you can use a mix of, of unstained cells and spike them with, with, um, with fluorescent beads and use that to, to do the alteration. Okay. I'm gonna to jump to one for you that came in for uh, Yolanda. Uh, do you think that in coming years, omits may need to be revised as new reagents become available and older floors are phased out? Mute, oh. unmute yourself. Sorry about that. It's a, it's a fun question because I don't think that old fluorochromes are going to be phased out. Um, I think, you know, we have them, they, they do something and well, let's, let's wait and see, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing uh, to, to realize as well is that OMIPS uh, publish panels that are really well optimized and they work as published um, but there is no claim that they're the ultimate best, that you can't do better. So that goes for new fluorochromes. Um, we have brighter fluorochromes that say fit scene right now um, that could be substituted. Um, and as I pointed out as well during my talk, whenever you uh, want to transfer an OMIP into your lab, you always need to test it and make sure it works and you will, you know, basically optimize it for, for your lab and your application. So that's when you will, you know, instead of Fitzy, use a brighter dye in that channel and see whether that, how that works and how it might impact the, the panel. So short question, short answer is no, we're not going to, you know, just scrap the OMIPs that are there and, and, and retest them again, but, but they will always be useful, a useful resource. Okay. Yeah, and maybe, um, maybe just uh, just to, to add on uh, more one something something more you, you you if you if you take this habit to do your bright index uh, and you can implement that uh, as soon as a new die comes and then you will compare it uh, to to all other dyes and then you will see is that substantial increase you know and, and then you don't only relate on commercial comments but you can relate on your own data and see whether that makes sense to actually change things. Right. And, and very importantly, also, brighter is not always better, right? So as we know, it'll increase your spreading error, etc. So these are things to definitely keep in mind. Okay. Sliding on, we got one for Hervé. Uh, somebody says from the YouTube says, amazing work. Are you planning to make the CD antigen density data available uh, in mouse available to the community? Certainly a great tool for improving panel design. Yeah, definitely. The thing is, by contrast, uh, uh, so BD is actually the one who will release this information in one way or another. So we, we actually, uh, we will have a paper on, on this, so we will show uh, uh, highlight things. But uh, you, you need to go to BD people. They are, they are responsible for the release of this data set to the, to the marketplace. Okay. A general question that's open to anyone, any any of the three. Uh, anyone know how to handle live dead in fixed uh, fixed uh, fixed frozen cells? Could the fluorochrome be a fix of a fixable live dead be frozen and still work once thawed? So I, I can comment on that because uh, we tried that actually uh, uh, beside beside other things, and for some combination it does work. So you need to test it. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, it's working pretty well. And that, what we are doing now at SIF, for example, is that we get some reship reagents to people and they stain them at their place and send back to us samples and we analyze them. And it's working very well. So you need to validate that, but uh, it's an option. Right. Actually, let, let me follow up on that. Um, Herbie, do you think it depends on the, the viability diet that you're using? Um, you know, would you recommend any, any, any specific one? Um, I, I cannot really tell for that because we always use the same kind of fixable dye. So uh, I, I don't have an extensive uh, knowledge about uh, combinations, but I think people have to try and, and test over seven and 30 days and see whether that, that's still working. But right. I, what I would say is not, uh, it's not an absolute, an absolute no, right? You can try. 
Okay, another one for the well, one for the group, even though it was under Rui. Are there certain cell types where nonspecific binding is more common? Right. So any cell that has that expresses a lot of FC receptors, right? If you're worrying about them capturing the antibodies that you're using to to stain, um, so something like a macrophage. Let me, throw, let me throw something into the side for the panel. In some of my studies in my postdoc, I found that cells undergoing, uh, that are involved in being exposed to inflammatory mediators, such as say fibroblasts being exposed to IL-8, IL-6 and LPS, tended to notice FC expression in the cytometer. And then there was, a, of course, the very, uh, there's a very dated JI paper from the late 80s that said that under inflammatory conditions, uh, fibroblasts can present antigens. So that the, putting those two together didn't surprise me. So when I see or hear the, of, of people coming in with inflamed tissues, I kind of, I tend to expect anything coming through the cytometer. Okay. And can you decide? Can you decide the range of a concentration for an antibody titration? How can you decide the, the range of a concentration antibody titration? I think you kind of guys answered that, but feel free. Yeah, I don't know. Yolanda, or Herbie. <laughs> that was a great figure. So. Well, we kind of talked about that as well, and, and we had that uh, nice titration uh, figure in, in my talk as well. So you want to do a serial dilute, dilution of your antibody, and, and then you're going to calculate the stain index. So basically, you'll, you're going to look at the, the, the MFI of your positive cells and your negative cells, or what should remain negative, right? Um, and there, there are different um, formulae to, to, um, to calculate stain indices. There are, there are slight variations, but they all kind of give you the same answer. And it's basically where you have the maximum separation between positive and negative, and that's where you want to be. Okay. Uh, here's one, um, ideally for Yolanda. What practical steps can readers take to account for the differences in instrumentation configuration when replicating an optimized panel? Test it out. <laughs> exactly. So it's always the thing, right? There's this beautiful OMAP that that would just be like a jewel in my toolbox for the study that I'm doing. I'm just going to buy all the antibodies, throw them on my cells, and voila. You always want to test it out before you use it on your pressure samples. You want to make sure that you know the the a lot of a lot of panels can be easy to transfer from one type of instrumentation to another as well, but there are always little little details that are different and, and that might impact the, the panel performance. So you always need to test it out. There's no short, shortcut for that. Maybe one day we, we could because uh, based on laser power and antigen density, now you, you may be able to compute uh, the expected signal and at least it would tell you whether that's worth the try or not, maybe. Right. Yeah, so there, there are definitely theoretical um, steps that you can take, um, but none of those eliminate the final testing. Sure. It, it reduces it. It reduces it. It definitely can cut down weeks and months of work having um, all these, these beautiful tools. All right, we've got another one here. Question about the ABC values for panel design. Is there a cutoff value where you have a marker with mid-low expression, you'd want to choose a, a dye that, that's brighter than a certain value? Uh, for, for the ABC, I would say first that all what is below the, um, the beads, the lowest beads that is in the BBC is, is actually uh, purely computed. So we don't have a valid, uh, valid uh, experimental data, on, uh, not, not uh, experimental, but standard. So I would say in this range, uh, you need to pick something super bright. That would be my, my, my answer to that. Okay. It's a good basic one. Are there tools available to predict uh, high spread, spreading of the data? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, there are several tools. Uh, one of them, probably the most known one, is the um, spillover spreading matrix. Um, so you can do that with, again, you know, using uh, single stain uh, controls. And you can actually 
um, you know, build a spillover spreading matrix for your, you know, particular instrument and for the particular dyes that you're, that you're using. So, you know, you know I would encourage, um, you know, very much anyone wanting to do, especially a, a big panel, um, to do that before even starting to, um, to, 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 you know, to, to come up with the, the first iteration of the, of the panel. Right. If I may, I would encourage every core to do that. For that yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because you, if you do the bright index, then you can, from that, you can compute the SSM and then propose that to your people. And, and, and in uh, fact, right, when, when we're building a panel, we use these tools. Um, so if they're not ready available, um, yeah, we're not going to go very far. It's just a guessing game. All right, got one for all three of you. Watch out. This one's from Derek. Uh, the boundary for the FMO depends on the actual brightness of other floors in the panel. What happens if this changes between samples, clinical samples, perhaps? Do we suggest an FMO for every sample? Right. <laughs> Actually, I could start with that, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, the rest of the panel will, will want to also um, add something. Uh, this is a question I, I think there's Derek posted in, in, in YouTube. Um, this is something that actually with our open flow classes, uh, Derek and I and Kathy, we, we discussed this actually. Um, that's a very important question. So, I mean, ideally you would need an FMO for every, especially if you're working with human um, samples, you would, you would probably need an FMO for, for every sample. Of course, that's impossible, right? You can't do that. And, um, and, and most of the times you're limited with, with uh, the amount of sample. Um, and you, you're going to think, you, if you have a 20 color sample um, uh, panel um, and you have, I don't know, 100 patients, you would have 100 times 20 um, FMOs. So, so that's, that's um, probably not the way to go. So, you know, ideally in this case, you try to use um, an FMO for your, uh, for your control sample. And, and, and you just work from there, right? Um, again, I, I did mention that the FMO is not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect control. Um, even if you consider that the fact that you add the last antibody, you may also be introducing some unspecific staining. So it's still the boundary between negative and, and positive um, is um, the negative and positive is, is, um, is still hard to, to determine. So, you know, we have to work with, with, um, with, with what we can. Um, ideally, again, would, would be to have an FMO for all the samples, but, but you just can't do maybe, it. Maybe what you can do is that you, you take a normal and an abnormal and then do this type of work. I mean, it won't, it won't recapitulate all the, the possible issues, but at least minimize the major ones. Right. It, it's, the, the thing is, it's still hard, again, if you're working with, um, with, with human patients, right? And you have, you know, you don't have the, the luxury to, you know, test it out. Oh, okay. I realize that this sample actually the signal is brighter, so I'll I'll prepare an SMO for this, right? Uh, many times you don't have that that luxury. So, I mean, in that case, um, yeah, you're you're. So actually, here I'll I'll, I'll add a segue to um, to maybe um, you know Ryan and, and the rest of the, the the panel that's coming afterwards. They may be they may answer this uh, better. But I think um, using other types of strategies other than, you know, manual gating, um, or you're trying to look uh, for the, the, the difference between the negative and the positive population, using other more sophisticated tools may end up, you know, like clustering analysis, may end up uh, being able to, um, to work better in that case. Yeah, and I, uh, talking about FMOs, I would like to highlight also that, that FMOs are not, don't, are not always a good gating tool. They they allow you to estimate the boundary between negative and positive, but you know, as we mentioned, once you add your your test reagent, it might also affect the negative a little bit, and there are differences from sample to sample. So you do still you know look at the at the staining intelligently and and not just rely on that that FMO to set your to set your gate. So all these tools help us um, zoom in on the on the cells of interest and and gate appropriately, but we always need to uh, have a critical eye on on uh, the tools that we're using, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and I would say you know I agree with what you're saying, Yolanda. But the the thing is, in ninety something percent of the cases, 
actually the the FMOs will work pretty well. Um, but yeah, there are always some exceptions there that, that, that we have to keep an eye on. Right? I think that's very important. Okay, folks, we're going to have to wrap that up for the questions. Well, I apologize. We apologize for not being able to answer all the questions that, uh, that were asked. Hopefully we can pick through, I think, some of the YouTube chat and maybe answer them, uh, answer them offline. But at this point, I would like to hand the floor over to uh, Rui and Joel.